Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Catholic Recon Testimonies from Reverts and Converts. I'm your host, Eddie Trask. This week's guest is Dave Fortin. And before I say hi to him, I want you to know a little bit about Dave. He is a host. He's the host of the podcast Along the Way. And he is an author, a blogger, a speaker, uh, obviously a podcaster and radio host, if I'm not mistaken. Right, Dave? Am I, if, I'm, if I'm missing something, you let me know. Well, I, I am in the process right now of, of putting a book together. So I'm not quite an author yet. I'm not, you know, not yet. And um, I have done some radio. I was fortunate enough to live in upstate New York for a little while. And I met a great guy up there who, who showed me the ropes and kind of gave me some of the, some tips on, on being a presenter on radio. So very thankful to my good friend, Sean Kelly for that. That's hey, it is great to be with you, man. Yeah, no, I, I, I am excited. I appreciate you uh, agreeing to this and just for the, the listeners, just so you have some context, it's the funniest thing, how, people come into your lives and people I've interviewed. Um, you know, there have been people clearly that are local uh, to Idaho. And then my co-host on a radio show that I do locally, uh, Pat King, he, <laughs> he and I were driving back from a radio show and Dave called Pat. And I don't know what it was. It was, I really appreciate Pat saying, Hey, you're on speaker day, first of all, so that you knew that I was, yes. <laughs> but the minute we started talking, I think both of us agreed like, okay, when can, when can we chat? When, when can we uh, discuss our testimonies respectively? So um, Dave, I appreciate everything that I heard in that car ride, brief car ride. Um, why don't you take us back to the beginning of the story, how this all how this all began sort of my reversion back to the catholic church i um i grew up in northern massachusetts north central about 50 miles west of boston and that location is kind of important and i'll get to it in a, in a little while but i grew up my my uh family was broke i came from a broken home my mother and father divorced when i was about 11 12 years old we started having problems in the family and um I was the only boy in the family. My, I had two sisters and my mother really kind of had a, a mistrust of men after my father and really a, a disdain for, for men, I, I feel. And she would always say to me that you're just like your father. And then she'd say how useless he was and, and, and this and that. And it really kind of gave me a low self-esteem. I couldn't, I, so, you know, I grew up in that for, until I was about 17 years old, and I, I felt like I had to escape. I had to just get out. So I joined the, the uh, military. I joined the Air Force because it was the only branch that my mother would allow me to, to join. She had to sign for me. So, you know, I, I go back a little bit. I, I, you know, throughout the, all those years that I was living under her roof, I was always – she weaponized Catholicism. And it really turned me away and it made me rebel against my religion. And I, and I remember so vividly walking into my grandparents' kitchen and finding my grandmother praying the rosary. And that's really important because I, I honestly feel that throughout her life, she prayed for me. And she's the one that really planted those seeds of Catholicism in me. So let's go back to when I joined the Air Force. And I get stationed down in Louisiana, the Bible Belt. Now, I had rejected just about everything that the Catholic Church had said because I was really angry at the way someone who was supposed to love me unconditionally was treating me. You know, I was a, a, an emotional punching bag for her. Um, I mean, there were some really hard times, they were very lonely and, and depressing times for me. So I get down to Louisiana and I meet a bunch of great people and, and they started to, you know, accept me for who I was and, um, they, and they were Pentecostal. So I started, you know, visiting this Pentecostal church and uh, long story short, I couldn't quite make the jump all the way in because there was a guy out there from Poland, John Paul II, you may have heard of him. Um, 
he was just so holy and so such a good man that I, I, I still held on the roots of that, that, that Catholic faith, but, um, but I was still experimenting with the Pentecostal church. So. When you say, when you say experimenting, were you going on a regular basis or was it just off and on? Because some no, people it, it, it was, they, yeah, they, uh, they love the atmosphere. Obviously, I can attest to that too. So yeah, the atmosphere was great. Um, no, but I was there Wednesday nights, Sunday mornings, Sunday evenings. I was there, and and then they would have um uh these this prayer room that you'd go in and they, they would have somebody praying 24 hours a day, seven days a week, continuous prayer going up to heaven, which is you know, it's great, you know. Um, but I did that for about six months and then the, the depression, the, you know, the, the wanting to drink and party and, and all that stuff that, that kind of, uh, took its place. So, um, but within, I was always trying to find something in my life that was, would fill the void that, that would take away that depression. And, and I, I never could find it. I, I, I was looking to, you know, self-help books, you know, Tony Robbins and uh, Norman Vincent Peale and, 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 you know, all these, these great writers that have written, you know, wonderful books on self-help, but there was nothing that was filling my, my soul. So um, I just kind of went through life, just, just wandering, you know, until one day when I met my wife and it was my wife that kind of made me realize I need to step it up. I need to, I can't be doing all this drinking. I can't be doing, you know, just doing whatever, you know, I had to be a little more responsible. Uh, so we dated for a couple of years and then we, we ended up getting married and it was, it was, it was really funny because she, we were going through some tough times with, you know, employment. Uh, the place where she was working had got, had closed down. So we were, you know, wondering what we were going to be doing. So I noticed that she was off kind of praying, you know, by herself and asked her, says, what are you doing? And she says, I'm praying the rosary. You want to pray with me? <laughs> I'm like, I haven't prayed. I haven't prayed in years. I, as a matter of fact, the, I, there was one prayer that I would always say, and it was, God, thank you for this day of life. And it wasn't, I was not happy or thankful for anything. It was really, I was just happy that I hadn't been sentenced to hell that day. Wow. That's, that's how bad I felt, you know? So she's supported me so many times in my life. She's, she's always believed in me. She's, she's just the, the greatest person I've ever met. So I, I went down to my car and I got this rosary that was just nothing more than a decoration sitting on my rear view mirror of my car. So I went down and I got that and I couldn't remember how to pray. And I could remember the, our father and hail Mary and stuff, but I couldn't remember how to pray the rosary per se. So we watched DWTN mother Angelica taught us how to pray the rosary. And we got back into it. And I just, you know, every day we would, we would pray that, that, that rosary together. And it was one night when the, um, the, the, the mysteries of the wedding feast at Cana really, really just came to life for me. And it was right there that I knew that Mary was my mother. She was the mother that I needed. So, and I, and I say that it was a grace of understanding that was given. There were no visits, visitations, no visions, nothing like that, but just this unbelievable sense of understanding. That, that just just hit me which is really really it was really amazing that, that it was mary that that I, I started to come back to because it was mary that the pentecostal church had such an issue with and they 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 tore that away from me you know i i, I just I, I don't know i don't know where to go I didn't know where to go. So I just, I turned to Mary. And then I started to find out about St. Louis de Montfort to Jesus through Mary. And, and I'm still saying to myself, 
I'm not good enough for Jesus. I'm not. So my wife and I, it was a Lenten mission that was at our parish. And uh, she, um, she had signed us up for it. And this one guy stood up and he told his, this story. And it, and it was an amazing story about his son and how they prayed this one certain prayer that uh, really made a difference. And it was the Divine Mercy Chaplet. So I was introduced to that. And that was my two Jesus through Mary experience. And that's, that's the way my, my reversion back to the Catholic Church has been, to Jesus through Mary. That is, I, you know what I love about it is the simple action of saying yes to the rosary and to so many people that, and I've talked about this on other episodes, to, to so many people that don't understand, um, specifically Protestants that have no background in Catholicism, the idea of intercession is mm -hmm. scary or what they believe intercession to be is scary. And so many of them, they realize that they were being drawn to the mother of God and they didn't understand it because they thought it was going to be taken away from Jesus. Mm -hmm. Lord. And once that wall came crashing down, their devotion to the Lord as a result grew by leaps and bounds. And it's something that you can't just state and, you know, and therefore it's going to happen for someone. It's like I've described with sacramentals and different devotions. You can't just go in saying, I'm going to start doing all these things because these Catholic people told me about them. If mm -hmm. you feel drawn to it, that's the most beautiful part. Like where you open your heart and you, you actually say, I'm, I'm willing to do this. And what, I'm sorry, were you going to say something? No, no, I'm uh, just agreeing with you. Yeah, so your wife, cradle Catholic? I didn't, I didn't catch that. Was she a cradle? Catholic? Oh yeah, she, she, she was cradle Catholic. And never, she's, she, she was definitely cradle Catholic. Not always practicing, but always faithful. Always, yeah. always, always someone who prayed. Always faithful. Got it. Yeah, always faithful. What do you think caused you to say yes in that that first time for you to listen to Mother Angelica as she's talking through the rosary? Did you just say, was there a part of you that was just so desperate that you were, I mean, I think out of desperation comes humility. And I don't, I don't know. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but no, what? to be, to be honest with you, Eddie, I, I had come to a point in my life where I was, I was kind of happy with the way things were, were going. I was ha happily married to, you know, my best friend, the best person I've ever met in my life. You know, we had two, two beautiful kids still have them. They're out there, but they're grown up now. Yeah. Um, you know, so, I mean, I, I was in a decent place, you know, I mean, I was starting to move up in my, my job and uh, you know, we had a nice, we live in a nice town here in Connecticut and, you know, so, so everything was fine, but it was just the fact that she had asked me and she had supported me in so many things in the past. I, I, I mean, the least thing I could do was to support her in when she was feeling a little bit, I don't know if she was scared, but, you know, she was just trying to put, put things in the right perspective. And so I just, I just wanted to support her, but, it, you know, it was, like I said, it was just that, that grace of understanding that, I now have a mother that I should have had. Wow. Yeah. I've heard similar things to that as well. So then you, the, the months and years that followed your faith just started to grow. Is that, I think I remember oh, yeah. that before that it was just growing and growing and growing um, as a result of that first experience. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I, um, <laughs> When I did come back to the church, I, I I had to have a brown scapular. That was like, you know, I had to, I just had to get it. And, and I couldn't find one anywhere around in Connecticut. And finally, a friend of mine had gone up to the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in, uh, in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And he came back. He says, hey, I got something for you. He hands me a brown scapular. I was oh, so, so happy that I got that. But um, now I actually forgot where I'm going with that. But um what was your question again? <laughs> I was uh, wondering how the months and years that followed 
that moment with the rosary, how that. Yep. No, it, it was just, I asked God, I said, I, I started reading about the lives of the saints. I said, God, please introduce me to your friends. And I started reading about the lives of the saints. So obviously St. Ignatius Loyola, he was like one of the first saints that I had learned about, you know, he's a, you know, he's a soldier. He's, you know, he's a man's man. And you know, so I figured that, but I would come, come to rest. My favorite saint would be St. Teresa of Avila because I could so relate to all the things that she was saying in, in her different books and St. John of the cross. And I loved, I, I fell in love with the Carmelite spirituality, Brown scapular had, had that. Um, you know, funny thing is my birthday is October 13th. So I have that, that devotion to Fatima and the Carmelite spirituality, but God wasn't done with me there because he, he didn't stop introducing me to his friends. He was, I, I got the, the the friends from you know 500 years ago, the, the the saints from the past, but then he started introducing me to his friends today, the people that are around today that that are so friendly with him. And he introduced me to, to a guy named Larry Burrell, and Larry and I just became fast friends. He's Larry is probably like one of the most even keel guys you'll ever meet, and uh we we used to work at you know do some stuff at the church together and, and you know it was on wednesday nights we just bounce ideas off of each other and well to make this long story short he's now father larry burrell he's a late vocation that uh you know he's he's a wonderful priest he's a priest in the next town over from where where i live uh he's, he's just a great guy my producer i met who's who's in, in the diaconate now um, my producer for my show is is a wonderful friend. I met I've met so many great people being in the Catholic Church, and they're people that don't judge me for you know for what I am. They, they're they're people that are, are encouraging, and 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 I just I, I've met God's friends, and that's and that was kind of the idea for my show was to be able to meet people that are and and talk about you know things that, that are relevant today. Let, let, yeah, let's talk about that because the podcast is along the way, correct? Yeah. Along the way, casual conversations with interesting people. Love it. Absolutely. Yeah. So how long, when did you start that? How, we started it about two years ago. Two years ago. And yeah. how often do you release episodes? It, it varies. I mean, sometimes we'll do three episodes a month. Sometimes we've done as many as four episodes a month but we we try to release everything on a consistent basis so we are uh we're, we've got i just recorded six the 66th episode last night excellent and so yeah. I, obviously i can gather from the um the slogan really um what it's about but what what do you hope when, when you launched it what were you hoping to accomplish broadly who are, who are you really trying to impact I try to take a different approach. A lot of Catholic media, and, and and please, no no offense to this, but a lot of Catholic media is a lot of people talking about catechesis, and you know they're they're, they're all well edu educated in the faith. I take the different approach. I'm the guy that's not really as as educated in the faith, so I go and I ask the questions that somebody starting out might ask. You know, somebody that you know has been practicing for years may ask the same questions but it, it's really just a, a guy meeting another guy and talking about faith and that's really what i hope to to do is to just to help people along the way that's great and when you say interesting people what what when you're looking for people because you never know there could be people that uh are watching this show it could be <laughs> on the program at some point what are you looking for An interesting person honestly what people are passionate about uh, that's like when i make contact with people um I, I find a lot of people on facebook and stuff like that um i just i just met a priest in rome he's he's from america his name is father john wikes what a super super nice guy um he lives in rome and he's a he's the the director of communications for the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. Wow. And I'm somebody who is currently writing a documentary, but 
I wanted to, you know, kind of just talk with him about, you know, what, what, you know, Catholic media and everything. We ended up talking about the founder of, of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary and uh, venerable Bruno Lanteri. And we talked about his saying, and it's, and it's so fitting towards to uh, along the way in that it's nunc chapi, which means now I begin. Even he said, even if I fall a thousand times, now I begin. And that's it just speaks to the mercy of God in that simple little phrase. So I, I ask people, what are you passionate about? What what really you know gets you going on in your walk with God? And people, you know, last night I spoke with uh, Deacon uh, Donald Prendergast, who is a uh, a deacon, but he's also part of the uh, Catholic Crossbearers motorcycle ministry. And we talked about simplicity and faith. You know, as, as Catholics, we are so fortunate to have the ability to have someone like St. Therese of Lisieux or St. Thomas Aquinas. You can have the little way, or you can have the Summa Theologica. <laughs> that you is know? a great, great point. I love that. You know, yeah. you know so, I mean, we have Catholic tradition, and we have, you know, more, uh, what's the word? Uh, we have people that are, that are part of the Novus Ordo, and, and they're, it's all beautiful, that's, and that's oh, the beauty of the church. Yeah, different rites. Um, yep. Yep, absolutely. The church is universal for a reason. Absolutely. What's fascinating about the saints is, I guess, the obvious um, there are so many people. No, I guess it isn't obvious. There are people that may have that simple faith and may feel that they are uneducated in the faith mm. um, and may be drawn to St. Thomas Aquinas. And the other side of that, people that are highly educated, that in no way implies that they're going to gravitate to St. Augustine and other right. Well, not St. Therese is a doctor of the church. That's what's that's the other beautiful part. It's not a framework that is so um, restricted that you think, mm -hmm. guess what a doctor of the church looks like or how their faith is expressed. That right. is, I think is so beautiful. And what you said about the now I begin, um, I, I think about any time you leave the confessional, mm -hmm. that is certainly, and even leaving mass. Absolutely. I began. Yeah, very good. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is since, so, so when did you revert? What year was that? Would you say that was official? I think it's about 12 years ago now. 12 years ago. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is it that you've noticed? What makes you optimistic? I've wanted to ask this of a, of a number of people. I just keep forgetting. What makes you mm -hmm. optimistic about the church when from the outside and even from the inside, a lot of people are saying, wow, this is a, this is a horrible phase for the church. What makes you optimistic? You know, it's, it's funny you should ask that because where I met Pat King was at a conference for the Knights of Columbus. And the Knights of Columbus are rolling out a new program. It's not even really a program. It's an, more of an initiative. Sure. And it's, and it's about evangelization. See, I believe that this is the that the Catholic Church is the true church. It is the church that Jesus Christ said, "The gates of hell will not prevail against this." And I honestly feel that Father McGivney set up a, a wonderful organization in the Knights of Columbus, Agreed. and we are going to have a revival. We are going to have you know some some great times ahead of us as far as evangelization goes. Yeah. So I, that's, that gives me hope. That gives you hope. Yeah, I would agree. Um, certainly the number of people that it's not just the, it's the evangelization that where the heart is engaged very much and you're share, sharing concern for others and they can see uh, charity coming from you. But it's also at such a time because of all the videos that are being produced every day, mm -hmm. hacking the faith, I'm noticing more and more people are learning basic apologetics so that they're they have that charitable position but at the same time they're able to defend the faith so 
there's an optimism that comes from them when they're talking to people. And I'm seeing that more and more online. It's actually quite fascinating mm -hmm. because everyone can start a channel. Anyone can post a TikTok video. Yep. And there are people, um, young and old alike, that are engaging and they have such a, uh, a security in their faith. That it's a it's a good thing to see for sure. Yeah, and you know what? One of the the most important tools I think in evangelization is for a guy or a girl to be able to tell their their story, and tell it with authority, and tell it with with the uh, uh, just to be able to get it out there and, and and just let people know they're not alone because so many people feel alone, and in order to evangelize, we need to be friendly to people. Yeah, so you're saying getting out and telling their um, their testimony you're talking about. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and this is why shows like yours are so important because uh, people need need to see. I'm not used to being on this side of the microphone. I'm I'm used to being the guy asking the questions, and I can just sit back and you know I don't have to you know. So it's it's good that I'm I'm here, but um, yeah. What what. What strikes me and will continue to strike me is there are testimonies that have been an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. There are testimonies that have been two minutes. Yep. It doesn't matter what the length is. This isn't, okay, elevator pitch versus, like I said, hour long discourse. Mm -hmm. If the person went through, this is just my opinion, if a person went through something it was long and painful and drawn out and falling out with the parents and the siblings and near death experiences. I say, go for it. Talk about it. Talk about, take, take the person, whoever that is that you're sharing it with, take them on that ride. Um, and that could be exactly what they need to hear. And on the other side of the coin, if, it's a, I just love your testimony. If it's as simple as I decided to pray with my wife and everything changed at that moment, people need to hear that just the same. Yep. And the Catholic church, I mean, in my own experience, having researched a bunch of different denominations, and I describe it that once you see denominations, you're, you're in a position, you have a vantage point where you can see essentially that you're kind of going upstream at some point. Yep. Once you go upstream, you hit this point where you're either in no man's land and you can't affirm Protestantism or Orthodoxy or Catholicism, or you continue to go upstream and you continue to research. That's what happened for me. And there have been people that have shared, and I love it when I put my testimony out there, they wrote back and said, ditto brother. And mm -hmm. that is a beautiful thing when you, it's not only the ditto brother, it's, Hey, let me explain how my, um, what kickstarted that research. And that is what I find fascinating. A lot of times it's someone, a Catholic cousin or whoever lights a, not lights a fire. How do I explain this? They say some small thing because they are courageous, the Catholic talking to the Protestant. Mm -hmm. They don't want to say, but they say something that plants a seed. And then 12 years later, two years later, two months later, we have no idea. They cannot um, resist, so to speak, and uh, yep. join RCIA. I just love those those stories. Well, just for a second, I'd like to go back to how powerful each person's story can be yeah. for me the the gentleman that stood up and talked about divine mercy his, his story was only two minutes long but yet uh you you listen to jim Wahlberg. he was in prison yeah he met he met mother Teresa. and and you know there's there's a story right there that, that it was mother Teresa's testimony to jim Wahlberg. it was this guy mike's testimony to me that that moved us forward and one of the one of the most rewarding things that i've ever done was i do a lot of work with writing talks for with, with people i help guys tell their story and 
it, it's it's very healing, very therapeutic to for for men to sit and, and and think about their story and put it down on paper and then stand before guys and give that talk. It's very, very therapeutic. Yeah, it is. Um, and as much as we want, how do I say it? I've spoken to a number of guys that were just like me. They, in their previous life, pre-conversion, if you will, mm -hmm. they were chasing status and affirmation constantly and all this. And then once they cross this threshold, they want to share their story purely for the sake of helping others that are currently chasing status, <laughs> that are mm -hmm. currently chasing titles, that are currently insecure at the same time, currently, um, they would say cowardly, you know, not wanting to face certain things, not wanting to investigate certain things because their life is easier by not kind of like putting their head in the sand. And so sure. I've spoken to a number of guys that that are willing to step out. And now when they're sharing their story again, it's only for the benefit of those that are where they were. And yet again, another beautiful, beautiful thing. Now, Dave, I want to ask you also, um, about the future of the podcast mm. is it your plan to continue doing what you're doing do you have any other um, ideas on the horizon that you want to share and i want you to make sure that you share all the relevant details with me so i can post it in the in the show notes uh in the um yeah i i hope to meet more podcasters i want to offer them a place to uh post their their podcast on my website www.castingthe.net uh i do plan on on doing more podcasts you know my own show because i absolutely love it it's, it's you know i grew up in uh, you know just outside of worcester massachusetts 50 miles west of boston we had great talk radio and radio has always been uh something that i really wanted to do but i never had the confidence to do it as your you know, viewers will see, I have a face for radio and a voice for silent meditation. Um, <laughs> so I heard the first part, but the the second part that's good. Yeah, yeah. But um, maybe I should just stick to trying to write books. Um, but anyways, uh, I kind of consider myself the Henry David Thoreau of Catholicism. I try to keep it simple. Yep. And that's what I want to do. I just want a, a podcast that keeps keeps the faith simple, where people can just come and and, and gravitate to it. Hopefully, uh, have a following, create an online community where we can, you know, just have uh, you know share share our faith, share I love our it. stories. I love it. And Dave, once I don't, once I'm on your show, what it mm -hmm. would be cool, I think, is I could post the link to that in yep. this into this episode. Um, because the other thing I've noticed on YouTube, um, and this is going to happen a, a bit for me over the next few months is I interview someone, they interview me and to just yep. see the other, uh, the other side of it, like you're saying, you know, you're typical on the other side asking the questions. Um, but I want to, I want to thank you, Dave, for a number of reasons. Um, back to that quick chat that we had in Pat's vehicle last week. Um, the fire that was coming out of you, the yep. intensity of fighting for the faith, fighting for brothers, evangelizing, um, keep it up. I commend you. Like in minute you, started talking, I'm like, Dave, that's what I'm talking about. And I always, I continue to think of Keith Nestor, one of my first interviews. He's, he's great on YouTube. He was a former Protestant pastor. First time I spoke to him, same thing, like just this incredible fire. And so just just keep it going. I look forward to being on your show. Is there anything else you want to add to the you know, add to the show? So the listeners, just to be um, perfectly clear, we get a strong mix of cradle Catholics and mm -hmm. a lot of. OK, 
a mixture of cradle Catholics, converts, and there's probably, I would guess, 30 percent of people that are Protestant and mm -hmm. simply seeking. So do you have any any messages for any of those groups, really? Well, thank you for for listening to this show. I mean, I, this is quickly becoming one of my favorite shows. There's, there's a handful of them out there that I listen to. And this is one that's that's great. Honestly, just open your, your heart to the truth. I know that, you know, to, to my Protestant brothers and sisters that are out there, that Mary may seem a little strange to you. Um, she is the quickest and safest way to get to Jesus. She really is. Um, you, you, you know, Protestants will, will ask each other to pray for, for, you know, for each other. Just ask Mary to pray for you. It's, it's, it's that simple. We as Catholics, we believe that the saints are alive in heaven. And that's why we ask them to pray for us because we believe that the words of Jesus Christ said, and we just believe in, in the power of prayer. So just know that, and if, if you're seeking because there's something wrong, you're not alone. Find a community that, that can help you through this, this, this period of, uh, if you've been abused or, or anything like that, please seek the help that you need. There's a community, there's a Catholic people that will not judge you. So, Excellent. Um, you know, along the way is about being along the way. It's we're all there together and we have, there's some, some people that are, are back behind us and we need to kind of help them along. And there's people in front of us that are helping us along. So it's, it's a journey. We're a pilgrim a group of pilgrims that are along the way. I like it a lot, Dave. Thank you so much for that, for your witness again. Um, and Everyone, thank you for watching. Please share, like, comment, etc. Until next time, take care and God bless.